only going to talk about the functional array part, and there's not time for the extensible of sparse stuff. Uh, so about 20 years ago, I had a paper on this stuff, but at the time, the algorithm was not really feasible to implement. Uh, but hardware has come along a lot since then, so I think it's time to dust off this, uh, this algorithm. And I'm going to skip almost all the details in the talk and just try to give you the ideas behind it. Um, so everybody knows what an array is, an imperative array. I mean, um, four kind of arrays. Um, we're just going to be concerned with one-dimensional arrays. And the critical point is that the implementation will calculate the address of an element and then access the element. We all know how arrays work. Um, Here's one way I like to look at functional versus imperative languages. In an in imperative language, you calculate some new data, and then you zap it on top of an old word in memory, and you destroy the old information. So you're doing some storage management at the same time you're doing the computing, whether you want to or not. And in a pure functional language, you calculate a new value, and you allocate new space for it, and you're not required to destroy anything old. And then it's left to a garbage collector to, uh, to reclaim that space. So with that in mind, let me give you my definition of a functional array. There, there are some variations, but we're going to have a constant empty, which is the empty array. It's always there and it has nothing in it. Uh, now, you don't dimension up a big array and allocate it and have it undefined. Uh, the, uh, only way you can create an array is with update, and the only way to access it is with lookup. So with lookup, you give an array and an index, and you might get an element value at that index. And with update, you give it an array, an index, and a value, and you get back a new array. And the new array is just like the old array, except that at this index it has that value but otherwise it's identical to the older array. And the critical thing is, this does not destroy the old array. The old array still exists and has not been affected at all. Um, yeah? Yeah, it's a my handle. Yeah, so... Do arrays have bounds? No. Um, no, they don't. I'm, Actually, there are more operations than this because of the extensible and sparse stuff. I'm just omitting a lot of, a lot of that. So all I'm going to talk about is the lookup and update. Um, now, this is just another data structure. Historically, these were discovered in the context of functional programming. But actually, you could have functional arrays in an imperative language or uh, most people doing array computing in Haskell are using imperative arrays in a functional language. It's not that functional arrays are arrays in Haskell, it's just a different data structure than imperative arrays. Now, they're hard to implement, and it's actually interesting to survey all the different ways to do it. There's some nice naive algorithms, like you can uh, define algebraic data types and actually turn the specification of update and lookup into an implementation. If you do that, update is fast, and lookup turns into a list traversal. Another thing that you could do, if you want, is when you do an update, recopy the array. So your old array is just fine, and your new array has fast lookup, but update becomes expensive. Now, if you get fancy, there are a lot of ways that you can make both lookup and update slow. But they are better than in this case. And there are amortized analyses and so on. So there are a lot of ways you can fudge. But this is leading up to uh, a conjecture I want to make. My conjecture is there does not exist an algorithm that implements these such that you don't have any restrictions on updates. And look up an update always take constant time. If you place restrictions on what updates you can do, uh, then you, you can do that, of course. Um, it would be quite interesting to try to prove this conjecture, but I do believe it's true. And that brings me to the main result of my talk, which is I'm going to give you an algorithm that does that. So 
uh, something seems peculiar here. And uh, to explain that, I'd like to uh, think about a game I call it the complexity game. So in this game, you're given a random access machine. That's a theoretical model, which is sort of like a von Neumann architecture. It's used in computability theory. So you're given a random access machine, and you're given a problem to solve and a target complexity you want to achieve. And then if you go at this game, what you have to do is find some algorithm which will make the machine solve the problem and achieving the desired space and time complexity. Um, so it depends on how clever you are. I'd like to look at a different version where instead of having the random access machine, you're given a pile of flip-flops and logic gates. And instead of programming the machine, you connect up these flip-flops and logic gates. And they have their own syntax rules as, as to what causes, what forms a well-formed circuit and what you can do. So it's, it's structurally rather simpler, uh, similar to programming, uh, just kind of lower level. Now, there are two approaches you can take. And the normal approach is to say that there are hardware people and there are software people, and they can never be on the same continent at the same time. So you use your logic pro components to build a RAM machine. Somebody else has done that. And then you program it. Now, if the conjecture I made earlier is true, and I believe it's true, you have already lost the game. Another thing that you could do, and this is the approach I'm going to follow, is use your logic components to do something that you can't do on a RAM. And then use that capability to win the game. So actually, I cheated a bit earlier. The conjecture I gave was that the random access machine can't do look up and update in constant time. And when I said I'm going to give you an algorithm that does it, it's not an algorithm that runs on a random access machine. You have to start with your flip-flops and logic gates. And we're going to connect them up to provide effectively an instruction set. And the instructions have, according to several measures, the same complexity as RAM instructions, but they do more work. And with them, we're going to be able to achieve this. And the key issue, of course, is, is memory. So in a RAM memory, that is the random access memory that's used in the random access machine, um, if you want some data, you supply the address of the data, and the memory gives the con contents. Now, how does it actually work? There has to be an address decoder tree. So if you look at gate delay time, then this is a order log n time operation, although we usually treat it as just order one. The important thing to notice is that on the RAM, all order n of your words are active on every memory access, but you only get order one useful work done. And it's the difference between those which is the reason why the RAM has less power. Now, the approach I'm going to take is is motivated by associative memory. And the idea is, in the memory, each cell has a tuple, not just a, a value. And what you could do is, for example, a memory fetch where I say x is foo, and the memory will respond with the corresponding value of y. But I don't care where in the memory that is. I care about the data that's associated with the uh, value that I gave. Now, this can be implemented in order log n time. That is, its complexity in gate delay, component count, and so on, is the same as for a RAM memory. But with cleverness, you can do order n useful work with this. Um, now, how does an associative memory work? Well, every word of memory contains a bunch of flip-flops to hold the state. And it also contains a lot of logic gates that uh, can do things like comparisons and, and so forth. What I say a lot of logic gates, you might have on the order of 100 flip-flops, and you might have on the order of 100 to 1,000 logic gates. Um, and then instead of having a tree of logic gates to decode addresses, 
we enhance the tree a little bit so it can do some extra stuff. So for example, you might do a fold of the minimum function. And so this kind of machine will have a small constant factor of increased hardware uh, than a RAM, but its complexity is the same. And I'm uh, omitting some little issues. Now, we all know about task parallelism, where you create threads, and it's good for multi-cores, and data parallelism. And uh, you, you think of organizing the parallelism across the aggregate data structures. And um, I think that we actually should have another model, which I like to call circuit parallelism. I gave a talk on this a few years ago here. It's basically like data parallelism. At the top level, your algorithm looks sequential, like data parallelism. It provides fast operations on large aggregate structures. That's the same as data parallelism. The difference is, in this style of algorithm, you can have operations that require work on every memory cell. I don't mean every cell in your data structure. I mean every memory cell in the entire machine. And that's not like data parallelism. So this is a lot of extra work. And the reason that this is feasible is that we've got a digital circuit that, that will do it. We've actually associated the logic gates with all those flip-flops. So it doesn't cost us anything. And this extra work makes it possible to do a lot of um, um, very interesting algorithms. And the, these extensible sparse functional arrays are not the only algorithm you can do with this. So just a little bit about how these arrays work. Um, suppose I start with empty and I update it with an index and value, and I update that, and I update that, and so on. If you look at um, the memory cell that contains 100 and pi, that is going to be shared among all three of these arrays. One thing I certainly cannot afford to do is duplicate that information. I really need to have just one cell in the memory that contains this pair. And yet, in constant time, I've got to be able to find it, regardless of which of these arrays I'm looking up. So the key insight here is to go at it backwards. So in a conventional imperative array, the array knows where its elements are. What I mean by that is that the array is an address in memory of a block of words. And the index is a number. And you do a little bit of address arithmetic, and we find where the element is. And that's not going to work for functional arrays. So what we're going to do is turn it around. An array is just going to be represented by a code, like 39. So that 39 is just a kind of a placeholder or, or a name for the array. It's not an address of anything. Then all of the array elements are just dumped at random places in the memory. Doesn't matter where. And every element knows the set of arrays that contain that element. An array doesn't know its elements, but an element knows all of its arrays. And I'll call that the inclusion set for the element. So we're going to use an associative memory. And it's actually more than an associative memory. It's motivated by associative memory, but there's a bit of extra uh, logic. Every cell in the memory contains one array element and index value pair. It contains the inclusion set. And there's some other stuff. Uh, a couple more integers and, and several booleans. Uh, and the trick is how to represent the inclusion set, because we've got to represent the inclusion set, no matter how big it is, in a fixed number of bits. And we've got to do set membership tests in a constant amount of time. So you can't, you can't do that in general with sets. But the thing is, inclusion sets are not arbitrary sets. You have to start with empty, and the only kind of data structure you can get is the result of a lot of updates. And so there is a strong structure on the inclusion set. And the details of that will be in the paper. But the bottom line is we're going to be able to have a pair of integers, just two natural numbers, low and high, 
to represent an inclusion set for every array. And if I've got an element with an inclusion set of low and high, and I want to find out whether some array that has a code C is in the set, it is in the set if C is between low and high, otherwise it's not. And I can do this with, uh, with logic gates in parallel in each of the cells. But in order to do this, to make update work, the array co codes are going to have to change. And that means that uh, all the arrays will be changing their name all the time, which is going to be awkward. So what we're going to have is a stable array name for each array, and then a code that can change. But we'll have a mapping, which is a set of pairs of array name and code. And so if I change the code for an array, I can just change that element of the mapping. Uh, and this mapping is also held in, in the cells of the associative memory. Now, I'm just going to show you quickly the lookup and update algorithms. Um, the main thing to look at is, is not how the algorithm works, which takes a bit of time, but what the form of it is. So every cell in the machine, in parallel, calculates a Boolean candidate, uh, which this, this condition determines whether the element belongs to the array that we're looking up in, and this finds out whether it's got the right index. And it actually turns out you can get several candidates that are true, and there are, in fact, three different algorithms for disambiguating them. But um, one nice one way is to do a parallel fold using a function that chooses the candidate that has the smaller index interval. So this is a parallel map, and this is a parallel fold with an associated function. Um, so this takes two clock cycles on the machine. Here's the algorithm for update, and I want to skip most of this, but I'm updating uh, an array A. We do the associative search in one clock cycle to find out the code for it. The resulting array is going to have a code that's one higher. And I create the new cell and fill in all of its fields. But as I do this, a lot of the um, existing index intervals have to be adjusted. And also, the array name code mapping has to be adjusted. And for those of you who are not hardware people, that may look like uh, a number of steps. But actually, the, the entire thing could be done in two clock cycles. Uh, that's the first clock cycle, and everything else here is in parallel. Uh, so uh, I have a little example here. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the examples, but if you like it, I can also read some core notes to you. Let's say that we had empty, and I'm updating with index 1 and value 1. So we're going to somewhere randomly in memory put in a new element with the index and value. Now, it's going to be array 1. That's a stable name, and it currently has the code 1. And the in inclusion set is 1 and 1. Now, as I do some more updates, you'll find that um, we sometimes have to go back and modify inclusion sets of some of the other um, elements. And sometimes we also have to modify the array name code mapping. And uh, these blue arrows are there for humans to see the tree structure of the arrays you get. But these are not pointers in the memory. Those blue arrows don't exist. All that exists in the machine is just these uh, cells that are at random locations in the machine. And um, we can. Um, all the highlighting isn't very visible, but um, if you, for example, look up in array two, the algorithm will give you these two elements. And um, here is a subtree of all the arrays that are created by updating array A2. If you uh, look at the example, you can check the algorithm and you can see that uh, all of these lookups are, in fact, getting precisely the right set of arrays. Um, now, just a couple of observations about this. The, 
the uh, machine supports parallel maps, folds, and scans. I haven't described anything that needs the scans. What I've described so far only uses the, the uh, maps and folds. Now, a RAM memory has an address decoder, and it takes order log in, gate delay time, but normally uh, we count a RAM memory access as order one time. Uh, so I think that we should use the same cost model to compare different algorithms. And in doing that, each of the um, steps in the ESF machine I will also call order one. You could call them order log end time, uh, but that means that on a RAM also each memory access is order log end time. I have seen people who insist on saying that, that this fancy ESF machine really is log end time, that a RAM really is order one time, because the uh, ESF machine actually makes useful computing with that log end time, so you should get charged with it. But a RAM <laughs> wastes almost all of the computing there, so you get it for free. But anyway, I, I think we should use the same cost model. There are other cost models. And um, now, there's a lot of other stuff I'm not going to talk about, because uh, oh, this has been showing me <laughs> this sign. Uh, extensible arrays and sparse arrays, these are two other big generalizations of arrays. And all of the operations for extensible and sparse arrays can be done. Every operation remains ordered one time. For garbage collection, there is a delete operation. And uh, this deletes uh, an array and reclaims all the information that possibly can get reclaimed. And it also sets up so that future deletes will, will work right. The garbage collection is actually kind of complicated, but it takes order one time. The complete garbage collection on this order one time. It's, I think, two clock cycles. Um, and there's some experiments with implementation that are underway. Um, so the conclusion is that we actually can do functional arrays with absolutely no restrictions on your updates, where every operation is constant time and space. It's got the same time complexity as a RAM access. But the algorithm relies on circuit parallelism. Uh, so you could design an integrated circuit to do it, or use an FPGA. And a, a GPU is not very parallel. Uh, it has a small number of processors, like a 1,000 or something. <laughs> and, um, so the term massively parallel, I was working on massive parallelism in the early 80s, and at that time, they were talking about hundreds of thousands of processors. Massive parallelism became a marketing tool, so it dropped down to 100 processors and then eventually, you know, two or three. <laughs> so here, we want circuit parallelism, which is um, computing in every number on that. Thank you. Sure, there are questions about it after this very entertaining talk. Yes. Uh, well, thanks much for, for your talk. I like it very much. Um, I was wondering how fast the clock is ticking. <laughs> 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 well, you've heard of the ice ages and geological eras. So, um, <laughs> so I've got estimates for that, but I don't know. On a uh, GPU, I think that it's going to be difficult. Let, let me say 100 times faster or slower, slower than the clock on an ordinary machine. But that depends on a bunch of things that are not fully worked out yet. So I don't really know. It's definitely slower. But let me say two orders of magnitude. Okay. Simon? So the time complexity is not the most important thing these days. What about power complexity? Yeah. Yeah, and the, in a complexity theory sense, it's actually the same again as for the random access machine. However, um, there are some big constants there that are different. So, for example, on a RAM memory chip, it does not, in fact, have a binary tree that's decoding the address. And um, 
they, they do some clever things that you can't do in this machine. So I can't say exactly what that's going to turn out to be. Yes, you, all, you said you need a constant time as much uh, circuitry than a uh, normal one. How large is the So the individual memory cell, I'm estimating on the order of 100 uh, flip-flops, a little bit less than that, and on the order of uh, 1,000 logic gates, there's a whole lot of issues there. So one of the key issues is, you've seen this algorithm does incrementing and decrementing. Um, and some versions of it do a minimum operation. This requires an adder. Now, actually, the time for the adder is log n, where n is the word size. So that throws in a factor of log of log of n. And that's a pretty slow growing function. Uh, so if you do that, also the gate count for the adders rises. And so, um, in a practical FPGA implementation, at least at first, I'm not going to be going with a logarithmic time pattern. But there are a lot of trade-offs there. More questions? Seems to be all tea and lunch. <laughs> 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 <laughs>